I am with Tom Holland, author of Dominion, The Making of the Western Mind. Thank you so much for making time for us. Pleasure. I, uh, I first came across you, Tom, and, and uh, an earlier book of yours, uh, In the Shadow of the Sword, kind of uh, about Islam and its origins. And I'm going to run a thesis past you, and then you can shoot it down in flames. Okay. I wonder whether In the Shadow of the Sword is almost the opposite of Dominion, in that In the Shadow of the Sword we look back at Islam, which seems very strange to us, strange to the Western mind today. And yet you show how it very naturally erupted from the forces of late antiquity. Uh, on the other hand, dominion is something that is, you know, Christianity is very natural to us, second nature to us. But we look back to the first century and we see that, where does this come from? It's, it seems to have this origin that's like an asteroid crashing. Is, is that something, is there something to my thesis? Well, I, th I think that, um... Christianity is also a very important part of In the Shadow of the Sword mm. because part of the thesis is that of, of, of that book is that, that Islam emerges from a kind of confluence of, of Jewish and Christian and indeed Roman and Persian and Zoroastrian influences. Mm. Um, and certainly I wanted to do something similar for this. But the truth is that um, it, it was not initially Christian identity that was my focus. When I wrote In the Shadow of the Sword, I had a, a lot of Muslim critics who, who, who didn't like the way that I was um, looking at the kind of the, the, the origin myths of Islam and trying to put them under, under the microscope. Mm. And they said, um, you know, how would you feel about this if your belief, if, if the same thing happened to your beliefs? Mm. And to be honest, my, my, my beliefs were a kind of liberal, secular agnosticism. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that that was a fair point, and it was something that, that, that I'd been pondering for quite a while, hmm. chiefly because of the books that I'd written before in The Shadow of the Sword, which, which included books on, on ancient Rome and on ancient Greece. And the experience of writing them, and, and the Greeks and the Romans had always been my first love. Hmm. Uh, I'd always sided with Pontius Pilate over Jesus. <laughs> I'd always preferred Athena to the, to the Christian God. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so I'd always vaguely assumed that I was in some sense a, a, a Greek or a Roman. Mm. But I found the experience of writing about those worlds very, very alienating. I found in, mm. increasingly, I found them frightening. Um, I, I, I realised that I had nothing in common with them at all. Mm. And so... The, the, the question of where my beliefs, my assumptions, my prejudices, the things I took for granted came from, was something that um, has been shadowing me for as long as I've been writing history. And the process of writing shadow sort of certainly sharpened that. And so when Muslims said, well, you know, wh wh where do your beliefs come from? I thought, well, that's a really good question. And so um, a, bit, a bit like um, uh, Theseus tracing his way back through the labyrinth, following the thread that's what I wanted to do and I realized that essentially everything that I think and take for granted comes from 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 Christianity mm -hmm. having said that I mean Christianity I think mediates a lot of other influences from antiquity obviously the Jewish inheritance Greek Persian Roman but I think by and large the way that I have inherited the classical past and the Persian influences and the Jewish influences is through the medium of Christianity and I think that that is true not just of me mm -hmm. but of pretty much everyone I know mm -hmm. and pretty much the whole of the society in which we live. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that's why I wanted to write it, was yes. I wanted to do, I suppose, to Islam, uh, to do to my own beliefs what I had done to Islam. Yes, and your own beliefs turned out to be a lot more Christian than you had thought. Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. And you feel that others should go on that same journey in terms of owning up to a Christian heritage to the, the views well, of the Well, it's not for me to. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm yeah. not here to make people do anything. Sure, but sure. but but if I can write a book that people then you know I would very much like them to read the book, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And if it if it um, if it prompts people to, uh, to perhaps to reflect uh, in the way that I've reflected, I'd be very happy for the for that to happen. Yes. So when I <clears throat> go around university campuses and and, and share um, the faith, I'm a Christian preacher. Um, quite often when people raise issues about the Bible, I'll, I'll have a line and I'll say, um, uh, the Bible is such an immense book that even our problems with the Bible have been given to us by the Bible. Um, and it yeah. seems to me that Dominion is kind of making a, a similar argument about Christianity as a whole. Um, we might all have problems with Christianity. We certainly all have problems with Christian history and the church and, and various things that it's done. Uh, but it seems like the problems we have with the church have been given to us by the church. The problems we have with Christianity have been give, given to us by well, the church. Well, what I would say is, is that by and large, when um, 
Christianity is put in the dock and condemned for being um, patriarchal or hegemonic or oppressive or Spanish Inquisition or Crusades or whatever. I mean, right. I'm sure you will be yeah. familiar with the brickbats that get thrown at it. Mm. That um, the standards by which they the church is being judged and found wanting are themselves deeply Christian. Yes. And, and this, of course, is most famously pointed out by Nietzsche, mm. who is a, a very significant presence in this book. Yes. Because actually, I, you know, I, I read a, a, an enormous amount of Christian literature for this book, mm -hmm. um, but almost uh, nothing I read made me feel more deeply Christian than Nietzsche, because Nietzsche actually hates Christianity mm -hmm. for... Um, for the reasons that, by and large, um, you know, even even a, a Dawkins is willing to, um, to admire it, to, to admire it. I mean, namely, you know, it's it's valorization of the weak and the poor, mm. uh, and and that's what Nietzsche hates. Mm. Uh, and it, looking at it through that prism, then Nietzsche was was, was a, a brilliant classicist, enables you to kind of switch gears and 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 re inhabit a world in which Christianity does not exist and in which the image of the cross as an emblem of, of redemption does not exist. Instead, the cross remains what it was to the Romans, an implement of torture. Yes, that is quite a binary way of looking at it. So it and, and that would be kind of my um, instinct to read Nietzsche in that way. Um, we don't want to follow Nietzsche. Therefore, it's, it's either the abyss or it's Christ and him crucified. But uh, what, what if someone would say to you, OK, we don't go with Nietzsche, but there's a third option, isn't there? We don't, we don't need to go for the pale Galilean either. Well, is that, that is the course that, that by and large the West has taken. Mm. I mean, it has mm. taken the course of saying, um, w w you know, we'll, we'll take over Christian morals and ethics, thank you very much, mm -hmm. but we're not actually going to bother with any of the mumbo-jumbo that requires us to go to church. Mm -hmm. um, th the question that is posed by that, of course, is whether you can continue to have the bloom if the roots have been pulled up, and we don't know the answer to that it's as just, a society. Yeah. But we are, I mean, you know... It, it, I think the, the secular West is very much a via media. Mm -hmm. um, it is a third way. Mm -hmm. But reading Nietzsche and thinking to yourself, I don't want to go there, did make the way of the cross more attractive to you? Because that, that does seem like quite a binary to me. That does, you know, it's... Uh, well, it, it, it's not Nietzsche that, that brought that home to me. Mm. It, 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 it's, it's thinking about thinking about Rome really mm -hmm. uh, I mean it's it's you know as, as a, a child I idolized Julius Caesar um, yeah. and one of the reasons I idolized him was that he was not only a great man in almost every way it's possible to be great but he was renowned for his clementia his his qualities of mercy and, and, mm -hmm. and, and compassion mm -hmm. and yet when you when you write about him and, and you're that much older uh, and you realize that Caesar's renown depends on his feats of conquest in Gaul, where mm. it's said by Plutarch, probably with some exaggeration, but not a huge amount, that he, he killed a million people and he enslaved another million people. Mm. Um, mm. And when he celebrates his triumph, chains of these slaves are being dragged through the streets mm. and placards are carried, boasting how many people he's killed. And you realise this is a, a profoundly alien world. And the fact that it's founded on the systematic um, assumption that um, those who are inferior must be downtrodden and it's right and proper to downtread them, for which the cross is the ultimate emblem, because the, the cross is designed not just to torture, but to humiliate mm. and through the process of torture and humiliation to advertise Rome's power mm. and therefore to um, to insinuate into the guts of mm. those who who are um, subject to Rome this kind of gnawing worm of, of, of dread and while I was writing this I went to Iraq mm. and made a film about the Islamic State and specifically what they were doing to the Yazidis and we w went to um, a, a town where lots of Yazidis had lived. Um, the women had been rounded up and enslaved, and those who were not attractive enough to be enslaved had been shot. And this happened on a kind of open field between Sinjar, the town that, that had just been liberated, and the Islamic State, whose positions were about a mile or so mm -hmm. further um, beyond the, the town. And the men 
had been killed and many of them had been crucified in this town. Mm -hmm. So I was wandering around a town that had had exactly the kind of fate that the Romans had visited mm -hmm. on, 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 on towns when they conquered and where people had been crucified. And these people who'd done the crucifixion were you know, a mile away within striking distance. And I can tell you that I felt that dread in my guts. Right. Um, and it opened a kind of abyss to me. Mm. And the abyss was contemplating a world where the cross had not come to take on the significance that it has in the present world, even for those who are not Christian. But, you know, if, if, you could be an atheist, you could be whatever, but you look at, say, you know, the Red Cross... And it doesn't say torture, it doesn't say dread, it doesn't say terror, it doesn't say imperial power, it says, you know, nice people doing nice things for people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So even in that kind of attenuated level, yes. the cross has become a symbol of hope. Yes. But to, to imagine a world where, ruled by people for whom it did not have that significance, to imagine a world in which the cross existed to, to, to torture and intimidate its enemies, I ex did experience it as a kind of blasphemy. Yeah. And I did ex I'm sure that as a kind of religious faith. Because it was it was a response that yes. that came from deep within me. Yes. So how how do you explain then erupting into just that kind of classical world, the claim that God endured that kind of shameful, excruciating death, and of all the people to make that claim, the Jews. Uh, it's very that. strange. It's very strange, and yet clearly it, it it's drawing on. Um, elements that are deeply infused throughout Jewish scriptures. Mm. And the person so far, you know, we, we, our earliest source is Paul. Mm. So you look at Paul really for that answer because we don't have anything earlier. Mm -hmm. And you get, this, I mean, there, there, there are, from Paul's letters, you get the sense of two very strange things that, that Paul seems to think have happened and which a historian is not qualified to rule on. Mm -hmm. But one of those is Paul clearly has no doubt that Jesus has risen from the dead mm -hmm. and in some way is a part of the one creator God of Israel. Mm -hmm. And what's more, everybody else he's writing to seems to accept this for granted as well. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't need to tell you, Paul is an incredibly argumentative writer and all mm -hmm. his mm -hmm. letters are essentially arguments. But he's not, he never has to argue about that. He's sure. always taking that for right. granted. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second thing is that Paul seems to think that Jesus, this criminal who suffered the death of a slave, mm. who in some way is God, mm. has appeared to him personally mm. and has told him to, to, mm -hmm. to go and, 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 and preach this. Mm. So that's very mysterious as well. And you, right. you get definite, you know, whether it happened in a blinding flash on the road to Damascus, as Acts said, Acts is so much later that I don't think we can judge that as, as history. But based on Paul's letters, mm. you can absolutely... Something happened to make Paul think this. Mm. And it's evident, I think, from everything that Paul writes about in relation to the scriptures mm -hmm. in, uh, in his letters, that after this experience, he's gone away and he's meditated and reflected on what it is that he's seen, how it is that this crucified criminal could in some way be God. And he, he elaborates his understanding from what is within the scriptures. Mm, yeah. And he look, and, and, and so it's in that sense that what becomes to be canonized as the Old Testament is an Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a mm -hmm. crucial part of, of, of what will become the new covenant, the new yeah. testament. Yeah. And what Paul delivered to the Corinthians, he says in First Corinthians chapter fifteen, was of first importance, and we can sort of date that in terms of a sort of a creedal form to perhaps within a few years of yeah, it's incredibly Easter early. Days. I mean, it's incredibly early. <clears throat> and he says it's according to the scriptures, put to death according to the scriptures, raised yeah. on the third day according to the scriptures. So he's saying it's in total continuity with the yeah. with the God of Israel, and it still was the same. So it's a rupture. It's a rupture. I mean, it's a rupture. Yeah. It's strange. It's it's baffling. Um, you know, Paul initially seems to have been a persecutor. Most Jews don't accept it, but there's clearly enough there. Mm within the fabric of Jewish scripture, for it, it, it to be rooted in that, that mm. theological inheritance, that scriptural inheritance. What do you make, as, as an historian, about uh, people like Gary Habermas, who you're familiar with him in the, in the States? He, he kind of makes a minimal facts argument for the resurrection. He says there, there, there are a number of things that even very sceptical historians might be prepared to admit. Things like the tomb was empty, uh, the disciples had experiences of the risen Lord, which they 
felt to be meeting with Christ. Those went on for 40 days. They seemed to stop. Um, you know, the, Jesus died on the cross and then he was gone. And, and he kind of builds up a case and he says, okay, well, you know, did he swoon on the cross? Unlikely. Did the disciples steal it and then lie about it? Unlikely. And goes through and kind of comes up with um, that the resurrection itself best accounts for the historical facts. What do you make of that kind of idea? Well, it's very similar to the question that I had to deal with in, um, in The Shadow of the Sword mm. as to uh, why it was that which clearly seemed to have happened. People seem cl clearly to have believed that Muhammad was in some way a prophet of God mm -hmm. and that, that in some way what becomes the Quran are authentic revelations from, of, of the divine. So I, I, I left that. I mean, I mm, can't answer mm. that. I'm not qualified to answer that. I'm not, mm. I, that's not the kind of book that mm -hmm. I'm writing. Mm. Um, and likewise, with, with the question of, of, of what, my, what it was that might have explained why mm. already Paul seems to think that this happened, I, I'm not qualified mm. to say. And, mm. and I mm. think that as a historian... It's not my position really to say. Mm -hmm. uh, all I can say as a historical fact is that it's clear Paul believes this. Mm. And we can tell from the fact that he doesn't feel any need to, 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 to push this as an argument mm -hmm. that everyone he's writing to believes this mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And on the, the, the later evidence of the Gospels as well, which obviously is massively contested territory, mm -hmm. um, there's enough continuity between the under the the sense that one can get of the passion as recorded in um, in Paul's letters mm. and and the, the gospel accounts that suggest that there's a measure of narrative continuity there, but I wouldn't go beyond that. Yeah, yeah. That does leave a gap though, in terms of there is this incredible rupture that we're still feeling the effects of. It's like the Big Bang, you know. Yeah. We know what the Big Bang is because we see an expanding universe. We see this expanding thing called Christendom and yeah. There is something, there was, there was something. And do you feel comfortable that the letters of Paul, that you're, you're hanging that something on the letters of Paul? It seems I'm not to hanging me that... on the letters of Paul. Yeah. Paul but Paul's letters are, if you like, our first reader on the, uh, you know, the, 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 the seismometer. Yes. Uh, it's, right. It's the yes. first great jag that, yes. that lets us know that something's, right. but it's not in itself yes. the, yes. Uh, the earthquake yes. or the rupture yeah. or the yeah. explosion. Yeah. It just, it, it, you know, it's right. the, that. I don't know if you saw Chernobyl, the... Mm -hmm. um, the I, I didn't know. Well, but, you know, yeah, this three-part series, drama series, about the yeah. uh, explosion of the reactor in um, the Soviet Union. And when it initially happens, you literally see the air, you know, you see the air being ionised by the leaking of radioactivity. Mm. And there's a sense in which Paul's letters are the kind of measuring of the way in which the air is being ionised yes. in the wake of whatever it is that happened. Yes. Um, but 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 I think that um, I would I would go so far as to say that I I don't think that um, anything resembling Christianity would have happened had that first generation not believed that something spectacularly odd mm, had happened. Mm, mm, yeah. I think that that seems to me an irrefutable historical fact. Yes. What that odd thing was, how it's to be explained, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not not for me to say. But it was cruciform. It was, in, you know, and the, the cross comes through in the, in, in the book so, so beautifully um, as what a remarkable thing that God would show up in the midst of God-forsaken agony and shame. Ah, it's, it's, and, it's incredibly odd. It's yeah. incredibly And obviously it's odd from the Jewish point of view mm -hmm. because this isn't what you'd expect at all. Mm. Although, you know, say Paul is able to go back through and discover that actually, mm -hmm. in his opinion, it was presaged. Mm -hmm. But, it, but it's even odder for the Greeks and the Romans. You know, it's a stumbling block for the Jews, Paul says, but yeah. it's folly to everyone else. Yeah. And it's folly because, you know, it's a, it's a world in which um, greatness is manifest. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it's a world in which, um, you know, Paul is, 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 you know, he goes to Galatia. Mm -hmm. And Galatia is a place where the, um, the civic fathers are furiously throwing up temples to a son of a god. Mm -hmm. the Philius Augustus Caesar mm. who is the son of adopted son of Julius Caesar mm. um, has established a kingdom of peace mm -hmm. brought mm -hmm. order to the world he's published uh, a gospel about it uh, yes, he, 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 so, yeah. so, so the good news has been yes. broadcast around the world mm -hmm. um, he's died he's ascended into heaven he sits at the right hand of his father mm -hmm. and cults 
temples, uh, memorials have been raised to him. Mm. So this is what a God looks like. This is what the son of a God looks like. Mm. Um, it mm. doesn't look like someone who's been broken and tortured to death on a cross. Yes. So it's very odd. Yes. And Christians know that. And Paul you know, endlessly returns to this idea. Mm. And all the way through the second century, you get Christian writers who are endlessly saying, yeah, I know this sounds weird. <laughs> I know this is odd. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. this is really embarrassing. Yeah. And one of the measures of, of I think, of how, how embarrassing it is for Christians is that although they, um, you know, they write about it, they don't portray it. Mm. And it takes mm. a very long time. You know, so you, you do famously get um, graffiti mm -hmm. showing... Alex Lemonos. Yes, mm -hmm. kind of it, you know, mm -hmm. insulting graffiti. Mm -hmm. Or you get um, people who want to use the image of the cross for uh, necromantic purposes. Okay. But um, the the earliest real portrayal of, of Jesus on the cross by a, a Christian artist isn't until the end of the 4th century. Mm -hmm. And then you see him, it's um, an ivory that's in the British Museum. Mm -hmm. There he is in his loincloth looking mm. like something out of um, Love Island. I mean, he's incredibly <laughs> buff. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, he, he is an athlete who has right. won. Right. He's conquered, triumphed. Mm. Um, there's no attempt to portray this as what it was. Mm. And that's a tradition that in the long run emerges not in, in, in the Orthodox world, the world of, of the Roman Empire as it survives, but in the, the, the West mm. from, about the, uh, from about the millennium mm -hmm. onwards. And so over the course of medieval history, uh, of medieval Europe, then we do start to see a mm. kind of dwelling on, on, this, on Christ's suffering. And the ethic that comes out of that starts to be an ethic, which is not the strength and honour of the Roman Empire. It, it, it is going to the, to the garbage dumps and the trash heaps outside of the, yeah. the city gates to pick up the abandoned, exposed infants. And well, you're, you're, you're afraid to Macrina, uh, mm. one of the, the this, from this extraordinary family in Cappadocia in what's mm. now Turkey, which includes Basil of Caesarea, um, his brother Gregory. Mm. And um, between them, they, they, they explore the implications of the fact that um, Christ, who is Lord, comes down not as a king, not as an emperor, not as a conqueror, but to suffer the death of a slave, mm. the worst death imaginable. Mm. And they open up the, the, the notion that perhaps to be nearest to Christ is to, is to be the lowest. Right. That, that, that in, the, you know, the, in, in the very weakest, mm. uh, in, in those who suffer most at the bottom of the pile, mm. in some way they are closest to God. Mm. So that's why Macrina goes around the rubbish tips looking for a, abandoned babies, in particular a, a, abandoned girls. Because they are the most vulnerable, because they will be brought up and probably sold to brothels. Right. Um, so a lifetime of of, of rape yeah. ahead of them, and 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 she rescues them. Yeah. Um, Basil uh, sets up hospitals mm -hmm. um, where he himself personally tends to lepers. Mm -hmm. It's kind of you know, this idea that you risk death to care for other people. Mm. And Gregory famously argues against slavery as an institution, right. which is a, um, a, a kind of notion so radical that it right. doesn't really take off. But right. it's an implication that is there in the yes. idea that, that because Christ has suffered death as a slave, therefore slavery itself is an offence against, yes. against yes. God. Which, yeah, as, as you say, is not going to occur to the classic, classical mind. So, you know, Plato and Aristotle would say that people are living tools and slaves are living tools and doesn't yeah. nature teach you that yeah. this is yeah. the way of all things. Yeah. So this theology of the cross, this ethic of the cross kind of starts infecting things and, and tell us some, some of the other impacts that an understanding of the cross starts to have as, as Christendom grows. Well, I think that, um, I mean, I think that there are two great moral teachings that come from it mm. and which basically have lain at the heart of, of, of the way of, of, of the West's idea of, of, um, of ethics ever since. And one is, I mean, it's, it's implicit in the cross, but I think it ultimately goes back to, um, to Genesis, which is that man has been created, man, woman has been created in the image of God. Mm. So that gives every created human being a, a dignity. Mm. And what the new covenant, the idea that there is no Greek or Jew, the mm. idea that Christ has died for the sins, not just of Jews, but for everybody on the, on the, on the earth, mm. does is to focus attention among Christians 
on the role that the Jewish God plays as creator of all humanity rather than on his role specifically as God, as the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. And so what becomes Christianity and what becomes rabbinical Judaism are, you know, it's a forking in the river, really. Um, and so that's that that that's that's a, a kind of fundamental idea. The fact that that all humans are one. Yes. And the other one is the idea that, um, you know, as you're saying, that um, there is a strength in weakness. Mm, yeah. um, and those are ideas that kind of bed down over the course of the succeeding centuries and, and, and emerge as, as, as fundamental to um, the way that everyone in the West ha tends to think. Right. Um, I mean, really, up in, you know, no, no, no government has really considered otherwise until the Nazis. And the Nazis set themselves specifically to eradicate Christianity because mm -hmm. it was preventing them from establishing what they saw as, being, as the right. You know, the Nazis didn't do what they did because they wanted to be evil. Right. I mean, they didn't right. stop and think, "Are right. we the baddies?" They right. they wanted to do what they wanted to do because they thought that it was it was the best. Right. They you know they thought that that absolutely there is there is a Jew and there is a Greek and right. unless we get rid of the Jews, then they will come for the Greeks. And the right. Nazis assumed that the ancient Greeks and the Romans were you know, they shared the same race and they'd been destroyed by the coming of Christianity. Mm. So the the paradox is is that the Nazis end up committing genocide against the Jews because they terrified of what Paul had done to the Greeks and the Romans. Okay. So the Jews are wiped out basically because the Nazis think they're Christian, which right. is a kind of awful, you yeah. know, I mean, almost the kind yeah. of the cruelest paradox in the whole history of Christianity. Yes, doing a sort of photo negative Christendom on them. They, they are the Third Reich, you know, they're trying to establish that. Um, so there's a universalism to the ethic that, that Christians are starting to teach. Yeah, and there's a universe. So, so, so there is also, of course, a downside to right, that. Right, I was going to ask. Yes. So, um, the, the, I mean, I suppose there are two downsides really that 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 people who are not Christians would would say to this. Yeah. One is, okay, so there's no Jew or Greek, but what if you're a Jew and you don't want to have your distinctiveness dissolved into a kind of universalist mush? Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, we want to keep our own covenant. We don't want to be, and. So that's why mm -hmm. Jews have always been um, a, a problem for Christians mm -hmm. because they don't buy into the universalist uh, rhetoric that mm -hmm. um, the church has, has, has propagated. Mm -hmm. And this remains a, 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 a problem for the heirs of Christian universalism. It's a huge, obvious, famous, notorious problem for liberals. Mm -hmm. What do liberals do with people who have illiberal attitudes, for instance? Mm -hmm. Who right. don't want to sign up to yes. the liberal perspective. Do we tolerate intolerance and yeah. all that? Yeah. The, the, the other thing, of course, is that um, if, you know, as, as Jesus instructs his disciples, that they should go and spread the gospel to every corner of the earth. Mm. Um, therefore, the earth, all the peoples of the world will be happier and better if they are brought into the ambit of Christianity, mm -hmm. again, you know, people may not necessarily <laughs> want to experience that. And that then prompts and has prompted acts of violence mm. that um, mm. mean that um, if you say, well, Christianity is, a, you know, is a, a pacific religion, it's Christianity about turning the other cheek, putting up the sword, People can very, very readily point to plenty of examples from Christian history where that hasn't entirely been the case. Absolutely, absolutely. But they would be judged according to the molten hot centre of, of yes, Christian Yes, they faith. would. They would. But there is, there is, um, you know, Christianity as it's emerged mm -hmm. is is not necessarily a, a, a package with entirely internal logic. Right. There are all kinds of ways in which there are inherent contradictions within it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that has historically generated all kinds of tensions. Yes. Okay. So as, as a Christian preacher, um, I go around talking to people about Jesus. Some of the, some of the things that are often kind of um, said to me, especially by, by humanist friends, they will, they will say, um, um, obviously Christianity has played a part in Western liberal values. Um, but uh, even without Jesus Christ, we, we would have gotten to where we've gotten to. 
No. I mean, I mean, and, and it's so odd that it tends to be people who who valorize science and mm. Darwin and the theory of evolution. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm entirely with Stephen Jay Gould on this, who okay. says, who famously said that um, if you rewound the clock of Earth's history, you would not get humans. There's nothing inevitable about the way that that evolution has gone. If you know a creature in the Precambrian gets squashed, mm -hmm. then potentially the entire course of life mm -hmm. has changed. Yeah. We have, you know, we yeah. all have eight fingers. Yeah. You know, I mean, so, and, and I think the same is true of historical contingency. Mm -hmm. There's nothing inevitable at all about the emergence of um, the qualities or the, val the values or um, the teachings of, of Christianity at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you can't, you I mean, can't they would, assemble they would, them they would, from they other would, sources? Well, you know, I mean, if, if you want a, a, a sense of, of, um, of what the world might have looked like um, without Christianity, you could look at India, right. where you have very rich philosophical traditions, you have very mm. rich traditions of, of worshipping gods. Um, you, you don't have something that emerges and essentially wipes that out. Mm. Mm. Um, you, I, you know, absolutely imagine a world where Christianity doesn't emerge and, you know, that's 10% of Jews and, 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 and what, Jew, what, what, what the Jewish scriptures offer to Gentiles remains highly appealing. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of churn of, of conversion, but because the difficulty of becoming Jewish is such, mm -hmm. it, it would never rise, you know, it would never mm -hmm. become universalist on the scale that Christianity does. But you could imagine that there are, you know, people continue to worship the traditional gods mm -hmm. and that there are kind of philosophical traditions that go back many, many thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's no place there for Christianity in that, that, that kind of alternative world. Mm -hmm. And could we, though, have generated some kind of universal human rights and that, that sort of stuff? But I don't see why you would. Materials. Right. Why would you? I mean, right. the, the idea of human rights, mm -hmm. I mean... The idea that human rights kind of hangs in the ether, waiting mm. to be discovered, right. is, is as theological as believing that the Lord mm. Jesus Christ rose from the dead and sits at the hand of God the Father. Yes. I mean, it's, 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 yes. it's, it requires a leap of faith. Yes. The difference is, is that Christians recognise that belief in, 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 in the divinity of Christ requires belief. Whereas, you know, <laughs> lots of people just assume yeah. that human rights are something that exists. Yes. But they're not. They're, they're, right. they're the, the, the result of specifically legal developments in medieval Christendom, yeah. uh, the, the, the emergence of, of um, uh, this theory by the canon rights lawyer, by, by, by the canon lawyers in, from the 12th century onwards, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't just spontaneously emerge. Yes, but you hold dear to your heart those liberal values. You personally hold dear to your hearts the that the weak should not be cast off and that there's, there's an equality. Of yeah, but I recognise now that they're not you know, that they're mm. Christian values. Yes, yes. And of course, the what it opens up is the, is the recognition that, that actually, without Christian faith, mm. then w ultimately, what is the underpinning for that? Yes. And the, the, the kind of idea of, uh, that, that, that humanists propagate that somehow science proves this, I mean, it seems to me grotesque. Right. You know, science, science is a mirror in which you see what you want to see reflected back. Yeah. So the Nazis use science to justify you yeah. know, racial genocide. Yeah, and liberals use it to justify, uh, you know, let's you know, hug the world. Yes. But both of them yeah. reflect the cultural yes. prejudices of the, 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 the people who are looking in that mirror of science. Therefore, do you worry about Western civilization going forwards if... I mean, certainly the church is exploding in places like China and in other places in South America and Africa, but here in the West, it's on the wane. Do you worry that there's well, I little think, value I think, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about this. I think what's happened is, I mean, Christianity was as vibrant as it has ever been. It's deeply held um, in, in, in the years of the First World War. Mm -hmm. It did not precipitate a collapse in faith. If anything, it, 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 it consolidated it. Hmm. And in the years that followed the Second World War, again, there was very, very high uh, religious commitment. And then it, in the 60s, it dropped off a cliff. Hmm. And so the, the question is, what, you know, what happened? I think one of the things that happened was that um, we emerged from, from the, the experience of the war 
And as people began to realise what had happened, particularly with the Holocaust, um, there, was, there was a kind of recalibration of our sense of, of what evil is. Mm. Um, and so we no longer needed the devil mm-hmm. because we had Hitler. Right. We no longer needed hell because we had Auschwitz. Mm-hmm. And so ever since, ever since, the, um, ever since the war, when most people in the West want to know what is right, what is good, mm-hmm. they look at the Nazis and they do whatever the, the opposite to what the Nazis did. Right. So it's a bit like, um, it's a cross between, um, you know, Plato's parable of the people in the cave looking mm-hmm. in the shadows and, and mm-hmm. Nietzsche's parable of the, the death of God, but his corpse remains in the, in the, um, in mm-hmm. the cave casting shadows. Mm-hmm. What, what we're seeing is the shadow of Christianity. We look at Nazism mm. and the shadow that Nazism casts tells us what, what, what Christian values and ethics are. Mm. So enshrined at the heart of every Western society in the wake of the war mm. is the utter conviction that racism is the ultimate evil mm. and that the, the, the weak should be careful so there should be welfare states. Mm. And these have become the, the um, absolute foundations of the way that governments function mm-hmm. and universities function and opinion formers function and the the worst insult that you can give anyone is to say they're a racist or a Nazi. Sure. Yeah. The risk with that, which I think we're slightly seeing now, is that what do you do when people turn around and say, yeah, okay, I'm a racist, or yeah, I'm a Nazi, or I, I don't want to let refugees in, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. What resources then do you have to yeah. make this case beyond kind of screaming racist? Yes. And... That, I think, is when you start to realise just how rooted in deeply Christian assumptions these arguments actually are yeah. and how denuded the attempt to try and make these arguments is if you don't have this mythic resonance that Christianity brings them. And I don't use mythic in it as an insult. I mean, mythic yeah. in the sense that this is a kind of deep, rich... It, 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 it transcends ideology, it transcends mm. commandments, it, mm. it, it, mm. You know, it transcends... Grand drama that we live in and... Yeah, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's, yeah, it's drama. Mm. Mm. Strange new world of the Bible that we've got to inhabit. And, but without that, yeah, it, it's like castles in the air to start... I think, about. well, it's like castles in the air or it's... It's a, it's a very attenuated version. Mm, it's right. thin gruel. Right, right. It's it's inherently mildly boring. And that's the notorious thing about liberals. They're mildly boring. Centrist dads. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're, a, bit bo- they're a bit boring. Yeah, yeah. So would you hope that the church was stronger in the West? Would you, would you hope that Christian preachers... Well, I think, I think and... that... Um, I mean, I think that, 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 that this kind of liberal consensus is uh, it's been the center of gravity for so long mm. that essentially it's it, it's sucked everything in so it's sucked academics and it's sucked politicians and it's sucked um, pretty much everyone and i think it's sucked the church in and i think mm. that the, the, the church no longer in the west no longer kind of determines what people think i think i think that that, that it's the it's the kind of the the, the liberal um kind of gravitational centre that determines what what most Christians think actually. Right, right. Um, yeah. So I think that, that just as humanism is a is a kind of a Christian heresy, humanism has become so hegemonic and normative that it's made Christianity into a kind of humanist mm-hmm. sub sub branch. So you would you would like to see Christians uh, preach what? what? What would you like to see Christians well, say? Well well I think I th- I th- I see no point in, in, in bishops or preachers or you know, Christian evangelists just recycling the kind of stuff that you can get from any <laughs> kind of soft left liberal. Yes. Because that's everyone is giving that. You know, yes. if I want that, I'll I'll I'll, yep. I'll hear you know I'll get it from a liberal democrat councillor. Yes. If if you're a Christian, you think that. The, the entire fabric of the cosmos was ruptured mm. when, by 
this strange singularity where someone who is a god and a man sets everything on its head. Yes. And the you know there is a the, the, it, to say it's supernatural is is to downplay it. I mean mm. this is mm. this is a massive singularity at the very heart of things. Yeah. And if you don't believe that, it seems to me you're not really. A, a, a confessional Christian. You may be a cultural Christian, but you're not a confessional Christian. Yes. So if you believe that, then it should also be possible to dwell on all the other weird stuff mm. that um, <laughs> that yeah. comes as part of, tradi- and traditionally come as part of the Christian package. Yes. So I, I think that um, it seems to me purely, largely from a kind of cursory listening and thought for the day, <laughs> that there's a, there's a deep anxiety about that. A right. deep, almost a sense of embarrassment. Yes. That um, you know, ooh, you know, Jesus is really just a nice guy. Right. Um, he's a bit more than that. It's, I think, you know, I it's like stranger to Tom and Holland weirder. Yes. Weirder than that. And to be honest, the whole kind of panoply of angels and mm. the supernatural panoply that that you know, as I'm saying, I think has been mm. destroyed by uh, by the the way that the Nazis have kind of re- replaced that demonology and then made it angelology and everything mm. I, I think without that yeah um and it doesn't need to be a kind of you know a a, 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 a literalist reductive i mean of course you know there are all kinds of different dimensions but the the wealth of of, of christian reflection on this mm. is more than adequate to that yes yeah um i mean i i um I, f- I found of all the writers, I, I Christian writers I read, it was um, Oregon or Origin. What do we say? Mm-hmm. Let's say Gun. Let's let's have a Origin because okay. Origin then it becomes you have a brilliant Darwin. Part. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, Oregon has this um, amazing uh, image that he says was taught him by a, a Jew, his Jewish teacher, where he says that Scripture is like a, a, a great house with many rooms mm. but the keys to these rooms have, lie scattered all around the house mm. and we it's difficult to find them mm. and that's what you need philosophy for is to help you find mm. the keys it's kind of amazing borgesian image mm-hmm. um and i think that that's the kind of the, the the poetry the the strangeness the sense of myth that that, that should be brought to this i think that that ultimately if it if if if, if it's to be preach to something true mm. the strangeness of it the mm. way that it can't be framed by what seems to be mere reality mm. has to be fundamental to it right. Right. i don't want to hear what bishops think about brexit yes you know i know what they think about brexit and it's not particularly interesting yeah yeah you know, but if they've got views on original sin mm. I- i'd be very interested to hear that okay because I, well so, yeah. since original yeah. sin is a kind of perfect yeah. example it's the kind of thing that if you're a woke liberal, and I speak from experience, that you think, how awful. I mean, what a mm. terrible thing. I mean, what you know, I'm so on the side of Pelagius, Augustine, <laughs> what a terrible guy. Right. But watching um, the kind of the shrillness of people convinced of their own virtue, howling down sinners, dragging them down, mm. you realise that actually the, 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 the concept of original sin, that we're all sinners... Mm. is it keeps us all honest it's very democratizing incredibly democratizing and mm. that without it you get a mm. horrible hierarchy of virtue yes you get exactly actually what um atheists tend to condemn christianity for yes but because you know christians always have a sense of their own sin yeah and it keeps them honest yeah well, especially if jesus comes and says i'm the doctor for the sick then actually it enfranchises the world because well you're born with it yeah. you know <laughs> but, you, but 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 when's the last time i ever heard anyone Talk about original sin. Oh, really? Okay, I'll give you. I'll give you my book. Three, two, one. <laughs> okay. Three, two, one. Well, I, I, I was feeding you that one. <laughs> Have you heard any preaching that you respond to? Have you? Because you've tried out churches in the recent past. Is yes, right? I have. Um, I um, uh, I went to uh, the church in the village where I grew up, mm. um, where my mother still worships, mm. and uh, I went with her. Um, and it was must have been eight o'clock service or nine o'clock service on Sunday, so it was very early. And we got there, and there were about ten people, I should think. Mm-hmm. I was by far the youngest, all huddled in the choir stools, and I thought it was going to be really depressing. Mm-hmm. 
and there was um, uh, a woman um, conducting the service, um, and she looked like a stereotype of of a female vicar, um, right the way down to the socks and the sandals. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. And she gave this sermon that was the most amazing sermon I've heard. It was moving and learned and, mm. and, mm. and it was all about um, uh, the baptism of Jesus mm. and, um, and it was about uh, the idea of, of oil and blood wow. mimicking the um, uh, childbirth. So it was about... Wow. It, was, it was a right. fantastic... And, I, mm. and the fact that it was happening and there were only about 10 of us listening... Mm. It was like a kind of glow of uh, glow of the spirit. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And then um, I went back again, uh, and she, about I think it must have been just after Easter, and she she again was was preaching, and this time the church was full because obviously the word got out that she was worth listening to, and she gave them again. Did you tweet it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. disrespect. Yeah. I know. Uh, but, yeah. but, yeah. but 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 it it was yeah it, it mm. was it was it was amazing. Mm. So uh, yes, I have. Yeah. Amazing. Final question uh, on Twitter. Well, you're you're very larger than life on Twitter, and um, you you use the, the the platform really well. Um, on one of the threads, uh, we were talking about Pauline theology and and. Um, uh, somebody said, um, uh, there are a lot of Christians who are praying for you, Tom, that you not just expound Pauline theology, but you believe it. And you responded to the tweet <laughs> and you said, I hope the prayers are answered. Yes. I, I mean, I would, I would love to be able to believe. Yeah. Um, and there are times where I feel I do. Mm -hmm. So like I did in Sinjar, mm -hmm. as I say, I think, I think that was, mm -hmm. you know, a, a stirring and I, I, you know, but, um, I also have the, <laughs> the dinosaurs, which has always, from the age of childhood, always been a slight problem. Dinosaurs. And yeah. it's, it's, it's not because they contradict Genesis or anything like that. Mm. It's just the, the idea of them being obliterated. What role do they have? What role do all the other cre species in this planet have? Mm -hmm. You know, why they, you know, they, they come and they go and they vanish? And, mm. and how is mm. that to be integrated into the idea that, mm. that we humans have a particular dignity? So essentially that's the kind of thing that I yes. wrestle with. Um, yes. but, um, I, you know, I mean, who knows? Yes. yes. <laughs> so keep yes. the prayers coming. Keep the prayers coming. <laughs> okay. Word, word to everybody. Keep the prayers coming for Tom Holland. <laughs> thank you. And, um, uh, thank you so much uh, for writing this book. I thoroughly enjoyed it and I, I think it'll help me as a, as a Christian and a preacher. Um, and, uh, I, I tweeted out about this book and a fellow clergyman in, in Eastbourne said, uh, should we start a, a clergy book club about uh, Dominion? And yes. before I had the chance to respond, <laughs> you came in and said, oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, shameless. <laughs> shameless. Uh, but shamelessly, you should walk, not run, uh, or rather run, not walk, and get Tom Holland's uh, Dominion. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you very much.